Picard journeys back to 2024 and meanders a little in his second season, while Strange New Worlds bursts out of the barn with an epic opener that's updating the visual stylings of the original Enterprise. Dr. Trek, Mr. Larry Nemechek himself, is here to dive into the latest Trek offerings. This is a Trek Zone Conversation. Larry, thanks for a little bit of your time, my friend, to have a Trek Zone Conversation. We really mm. are being spoilt right now for Trekkies, as Trekkies, aren't we? We saw it coming, and here it is in real life. It's actually happening, yeah. New Trek a week. In fact, sometimes we even overlapped there in the case of uh, the premiere and the finale. Where do you go first? Yeah, exactly. It is just absolutely incredible. It's an incredible time to be alive. It's this whole wall-to-wall Star Trek we've been promised for a few years. The pandemic got in the way, um, but we're now here and getting stuff done. It is just incredible. Well, Picard's second season started and ended by addressing the biggest gripe of the season one final. We got to see some other ships, not just copied and pasted. And boy, weren't they... No copy and paste fleets. Right, right, right. Well, there's a whole new new team... I shouldn't say that. There's a lot of same people working, but the production designer was new this year. He's lit the fire on social media. I've had him on a couple of different places. He's going to be a Portal 47 guest. But Dave Blass is amazing, and he has a good team. They had lots, all the perf- – it's all the guidance and the philosophy. And number one, he reached out to Mike and Denise Sakuti, He reached out to Doug Drexler. He got you know Jeff Mendale uh, up and down the line, uh, illustrators and graphics and visual effects, and you can tell. You can tell that right out of the box, the first two or three episodes on the Stargazer this season and, and, you know, the, even in the alternate universe, some of the flags and graphics and in jokes and funds and Floyd's barbershop, (laughs) even, I mean, so many little Easter eggs and that's not what the whole show is, but it just made it feel so grounded for people. And it was some positive buzz to launch the season for a long time. So that was a great, that was a great bit. And, and a, and a different uh, tone in the writing room too. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, speaking of that writing room, Terry, Terry McNeil is running things, not Michael Shea. Not that Michael Shea, but isn't great. And and his, uh, you know, his his fiction that he he's done is great. And he's an old Trek fan. But Terry Metalis started out as a PA and an assistant to Brandon Braga back on Voyager Enterprise days. So and then he's gone off and done Twelve Monkeys. And so that time travel thread of Twelve Monkeys, you can see it at work in Picard. But that's definitely why there's a different tone. I've seen people, they enjoyed season one more than season two or vice versa, but def- def- definitely a different tone this year. Yeah, it, yeah absolutely. Uh, we were given a novel that took 10 weeks to unfold. Uh, my <laughs> wish is that we get a drop of all these episodes for these sorts of stories because it would make it a little easier to follow, uh, make it also a little easier to review as well, I think, and we're not sort of sitting week to week going, oh, but what about this? Um, maybe it wouldn't have seemed like some plot threads took ages to unfold. I'm looking at Picard as a child here. Um, I, I think it's incredible. <laughs> that we could actually find some new backstory for Picard. Uh, what did you think of mm-hmm. um, of young Jean-Luc? Well, I I was amazing. Uh, I was amazed. Uh, in all of the new Trek we've had since 2017, the best case of actually layering on something new to the canon universe that we existed, and I know this drove some people crazy, but the moment in Discovery when, when uh, Sarek revealed that he had been trying to manipulate uh, Michael's entry into the Vulcan Science Academy, and it blew up in his face the same way, actually, he had tried for Spock, and that blew up in his face, and we understood he had tried to do different things with both of his his son and his foster daughter, and it just added so much more to Sarek, and like, what is this wacky family he is, and you know, the Vulcans are wackier the more we get to know them, and weird, yeah. but Sarek is really an odd bird, you know, he he has a child by a Vulcan princess and Cybox out there somewhere. And then he has Spock and, and he has two human wives, you know, now that we know, I mean, it's, it layered that on and that, but what took the cake, what stole the crown from that moment was the entirety in Picard season two of when we find out that his mother spoilers uh, committed suicide. And, and the entire reason for Q's little lesson here, you know, it's like tapestry spread out to 10 episodes <laughs> Is um, is that he's gone through his life blocking that image of her hanging, you know the the pain and the trauma of that, and he even verbalizes and he says, "Well, I just try to imagine her as an old lady serving tea and asking me, you know, having a good time." And you immediately they don't do it, but you immediately flash to his image, 
way back early, like third episode of Next Generation, when he's having his delusions in the other dimension in where no one has gone before, and it's an old lady serving tea, and he says, Mama. And you suddenly realize you've gone 30 years thinking, oh, that's his last image of his mother when she was really elderly. And then you go, no, that was him imagining her the way he'd always wanted to imagine. It was his go-to image of her. And I saw people, compl fans complaining, oh, no, we just unretconned that. It's like, no, 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 you just added a whole new layer to your understanding that episode. And the fact that they did it 30 years later is amazing. So I was saying, sorry, Sarek, this is <laughs> now bumped for, you know, for the, for, and there is so much more going on here too, but that was just one, I mean, it, in a broad sense. And then I immediately thought, well, is that why Picard was, you know, wild cadet who gets stabbed playing Dom Jot with the Nausicans. You know, he, he, Picard and Kirk are exactly opposite. Kirk says he was a stack of books with legs who then uh, loosened up, shall we say, as he got out of the academy into his career. And Picard was, his trajectory was opposite. Picard was this wild guy at the academy and then became straight and narrow and more focused after his trauma with his heart replacement. Mm. And now I'm going, okay, here's this young kid who's seen his mother die, kill herself, and um, and blames himself in part for it, which is part of it. And then he, what, is that why he's such a loose card, you know, later on? I mean, it just does a lot of new stuff to chew on if you sit and, and put it back. Aside from, and I know we can get into this, the headaches, as Janeway would say, the headaches of time travel and all these alternate universes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one other thing that I know it was mentioned in passing, um, but for me, uh, and a lot of people sort of latched onto this as a reason, um, the the lack of mention of, of uh, Jean Luc's brother in in uh, in uh, Jean Luc's brother, his name escapes me, but well, him not being there, there was a sentence uh, in there about how he was off at boarding school, um, which is you know adds that layer, as you say, as to why he felt the need to come home. Um, and and do the family thing after Picard goes to the stars. Um, wish he was in there a little bit more. Obviously, it's 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 uh, Jean Luc's story. It's Picard's story. Um, but wait, 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 Matt. Do you want one more character shoehorned into oh, this? Now? I know, Pro probably not. <laughs> probably not. But you know, for, for, uh, for clarity's sake, I, you know, I I bet there was five seconds when they thought about having Robert, and then they looked at the other forty-seven characters, and they thought, well, let's just keep it simple. Well, here's 47. one place we can make a slice. And, yeah. Yeah, exactly right. And, and look, I, I think it's, you're always going to want something else. And and I think a lot of people have their own ideas of uh, of what it should be and exactly how often, um, you know, siblings should be talked about. It's, it's, it's an interesting one. It came up when uh, Michael was revealed to be Spock's sister. Mm -hmm. Well, Spock never mentioned him. Well, of course he didn't. That was 50 years ago. But... You know, it, it's this thing of how often do right. you actually talk about your siblings and instead of just projecting negativity on the show, um, and I'm sort of contradicting myself here, but, you know, analysing this point, is it, uh, is it actually a, a big bugbear that, um, that he doesn't get, uh, Robert doesn't get talked about? I, and I don't, honestly, no, I don't because, think it is. Okay, here's the, here's the big secret, and this will drive some people crazy, although it was a great ex adventure to watch. The whole season... The whole story, everything you see aside from a few minutes at the beginning, basically the first hour and the tag of the last episode, it's all a Q creation. It's all, it's not even an alternate universe out there. I mean, it could be, you know, in the multiverse, it's not like one of Worf's parallels universe where the board, you know, Riker screaming with his beard, the Borg are everywhere. I mean, you know, there's a, there's the illustration of how many, how many uh, enterprise D's popped up. So you know, but is this even even one of those, or is this totally a, a Q wet dream? Just like, you know, Picard is as Sherlock as uh, Sherlock Holmes. It's Picard is Robin Hood, or it, name any Q episode where he sent them off on some adventure or some wild heart to prove a point or you know cause a lesson to be learned, and or, or just indulge one of his whims. And um, so nothing has to. You know, they talked about Voyager about the reset button. Nothing mattered. Well, nothing matters here aside from the impact that the focal people have. And apparently now it's not just Jean-Luc, but it's who winds up at the end, you know, coming back. But all the headaches I saw people worried about time loops and threads and people trying to diagram the alternate universe before it was altered again. And it's like, you know what the bottom line here is? It doesn't have to make sense in the classic time travel, you know, uh, uh, problematic way. 
because it's all just a Q flash and it's his dying Q flash actually, which is sad. Yeah. So it's like, it's the great get out of jail free card for temporal mechanics. Exactly. Right. It just, it's and just whatever you want at the end, Q made it that way. So let's proceed, you know, with and Gerardi. Was Gerardi around to kill Maddox? You know, was she around for a four? Don't worry about it. It's all okay. It's a Q thing. <laughs> it's a Q because thing. when in 30 years has anything Q did ever been, you know, tech the tech, techno babble explained? It's not. It's a Q thing. And we've never tried to explain it. So we just had 10 hours of it in our face. That's all. Well, interestingly, <laughs> out of this, we have Gerardi off as the Borg Queen. We have Rios dead in the past. Uh, Elnor and Soji actors confirming they're not returning. Gerardi too, uh, as you can obviously mm -hmm. imagine her storyline, all but resolved. We're heading to season three as the swan song for the TNG cast. What do you think we're going to see here, Larry? Are they going to bring the E out of mothballs and go on uh, one last big adventure? I don't know. But, you know, in the old days, you'd say, well, that was an awful lot to do. And maybe it's just fan service. But everything is up. You know, you can CG anything now. It won't. It's just make a model. Make a CG model and have it fly by and then build a, a, your AR wall and have build a few, a few bridge pieces. Now, they've, they've shown glimpses, I think, of, of, of that trailer or voiceover bits. And it's like, what is Brent actually doing? Is Brent going to be B9? Or is Brent going to be another Soong? He's in it, and he's speaking in intelligent sentences. You know, and then you, the only thing you see is, is Riker and Picard about, you know, you ready for a road trip. So what is, is, that the whole, is that the whole season arc, you know, tone? Or is that like one moment out of the, whatever they're doing? But yeah, they're like, they're getting, it's sad to see it, but they're kind of paring down the cast to make way for not just cameos, but to have all the old cast, uh, all the old TNG crew, you know, part of it. And and speaking of people complaining about who's in and who's not, how how about that um, cameo for a certain person in the finale of season two that got yeah, it that totally blew people away? We are a, we are a, a week on from the finale, so I think we can say that it was uh, Mr. Crusher himself, uh, totally we can, and utterly. We can say Will Wheaton. Okay, Will Wheaton. Yes, exactly right. <laughs> his his storyline has come to an end, and quite possibly. Uh, he has been led into his own series now, um, and that Gary Seven series might uh, might finally be made uh, fifty years after the backdoor pilot. It's like, can we say I'll that? See you, Kate, and we'll raise you two more years. Yes, yeah. on your backdoor pilot order. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I love it. I, I mean, I saw. I mean, it was totally. A, I didn't know it was good for Will. I mean, I squeed a little bit when I saw it, but then when <laughs> two minutes later. When he, you basically, I, I mean, I was even bigger mind blown when he tells, he tells uh, whatever her name is in the moment, Co, uh, Kobe? Yeah, Koji, Kobe. Kobe? Koji? Whatever Koji. her latest name is. See how important When he says, hi, I'm a traveler. Well, we're in charge of the supervisor. Or whatever he says. And you're like, yeah. wait, what? Travelers yeah. are in charge of supervisors? It's like, well, there's two dots that you didn't expect to see connected, you know? <laughs> and you didn't know I, needed connecting. Uh, boy, that pet, that universe out there is a lot neater than I thought it was out there. Okay. If it if it's all a Q wet dream, is that actually true? <laughs> okay. That's an awful elaborate elaborate thread for Q to expend energy on. <laughs> if it's not That's true. <laughs> That's true. And you know, he, they're talking back in 2024. That after a so while, you're like, what? Where? Okay, what? Where is everybody? Okay. I think just go along for the ride and and just enjoy it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> No, that's a, and I just think um, Strange New Worlds is going to be full of some pitfalls because it feels to be straight arrow, but the mm -hmm. but the Picard wind up just turns into a, you know, it's like whatever we need to have happen happen, but but Rios and Gerardi are gone from the Stargazer Bridge. Think of the butterfly effect, and it's like you know it's going to be a tiny butterfly. I like the way they run out his life, like to say, don't worry, everybody, nothing happened because he stayed behind. Because we've already had you know we've had Jillian Taylor come forward a hundred years. In, in the prime line. We've had <gasps> Kirk take McCoy's glasses back and sell them at a pawn shop. Yeah. You know, yeah, exactly I mean, that's right. a, it's not like we haven't had little bits of butterfly effect already. So, yeah, we stumble well, along move. somehow. Exactly. Well, let's move into Strange New Worlds, Larry. Uh, we've been treated to that first episode oh. and it's certainly living up to the hype as a big fan of the original series. What are your thoughts, uh, first of all, on the visual update that we've seen with uh, our classic Enterprise? Well, <laughs> yeah, I've been worried about the bar being set so high lately for Strange New Worlds, especially on the standalone episode aspect, which is great. Um, 
the writing staff, Henry Alonzo Myers is a showrunners. There was a Star Trek Day panel, you know, virtual a couple of years ago, I think 2021. No, 2020, the 2020 panel, where you see three or four of their writers with him and, and Akiva Goldsman, but you they all talk about being fans and they're all getting teary-eyed. And I'm like, oh my God, this is gonna be I'm expecting great things from this staff if they're allowed to do everything they want to do. And I am glad for the visual update. I think this bridge is pulled back from the outlandishness of the, people loved it, but I think the Enterprise bridge you saw at the end of Discovery uh, was a little too much. Mm. And I like the way they pulled it back and brightened it up. So, you know, I, I think they're really looking to have it be their own design. And then as far as just updating the six designs, I will just tell you that my, the ship has sailed. Anyone still complaining about not exactly matching the 60s look? Even though I will say you could have designed it that way, but then shoot it, film it, light it, edit it, frame it in a, in a 2020s way. You know, design is different than cinematography. And I think an audience would have accepted that the way in a Mirror Darkly's bridge looked. Only you could have zipped it up even more than that. Having said all that, I think the ship has sailed on this. And if people are pointing to... Not just uh, Galaxy Quest and the Thermians watching Gilligan's Island as well as Galaxy Quest, but uh, Admiral Kirk in his foreword in the novelization of the motion picture, which Gene Roddenberry wrote. Kirk is commiserating about how he worries about the, the world at large, the public at large, got dramatized versions of their adventures and might see them as a little more heroic, you know, than they really were, than the ordinary reality was. And I'm going to adopt that. I saw a fan say this, and I'm adopting that model. I'm going to always love the original series look and feel, and easier for me because I grew up with that, as opposed to some younger fans now that it, it feels very 60s you know, and problematic <laughs> at times. And not so sentimental, but I'm going to put that in that box. And mm. I'm just going to enjoy, obviously, the motion picture forward is kind of what fits more with where modern design is and budgets. So I'm just going to... So everything's and every time we get a nod to something like Mbenga's Starfleet smock or the props, the tricorder and the phaser and the communicator and the tricorder. Did I mention that? <laughs> I think those are making people smile. So, you know, it's like I'm just going to take it for what it is and know this is what we have. And it's better than it even was two or three years ago, I think. And we'll just take it and run with it. And I will lovingly put the 60s look in on the shelf as those crazy, wacky public you know, consumption dramatized versions, um, the dime novel versions of, for an old phrase, <laughs> of what we got. So I'm good with it. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's see. I'm curious to see what they do conceptually with where does Chapel go with Spock and how does Corby come into the thing? And do we ever hear about Boyce in way to Mbenga and what happens to Mbenga? Because Piper we have later and then McCoy and then Mbenga's working under McCoy. So there's a lot of fun things I hope they play with. And I think they're smart enough to do it right. Like to Pring, people are upset that to Pring is mentioned before Spock and, and Pike knows about her. But this is young Spock and we're in the 2250, 2259. And it's years before Kirk and McCoy have no idea about to Pring, right? Or even Chapel, I think, is shocked, but she might be shocked for anyway. I'm going to trust them to, to navigate all those threads, you know? Yeah. So exactly I know people right. are, and, and Samuel Kirk, people are upset that only Kirk calls his brother, Sam. Well, Pike called him Samuel <laughs> and this is seven, eight years before Deneva. So maybe Samuel Kirk was in Starfleet before he was, a, you know, so it's like, let's just all, they, they've not, they've crossed T's and dotted I's on an awful lot. So I'm going to sit back and enjoy the stories for what they are. And then if something really makes me scream, I'll scream. <laughs> but for right now, I think everybody's, I think most people, even a lot of the Canonistas are excited for it. How about you? I mean, how can you not be excited for this? It's just, it's like a romp. It's like a breath of fresh air. Yeah, exactly right. And and I think also too, that there has to get to a point for Spock of all people to break as many rules as he did in the menagerie to get Pike mm -hmm. back to Talos Four. There's got to be a reason for that. And instead of spending two seasons of Strange New Worlds developing that friendship, make it right there and Pike and Spock are like that. They're joined at the hip um, and that's exactly what we're saying. It is incredible. The one bugbear that I've got, uh, and I'm guessing it's going to be the season-long arc um, for Pike's growth, um, is just the way that he's sort of looking at his disablement. He's, he's obviously had those flash-forwards of where he's going to end up. 
Um, he sort of, or he has directly compared that to uh, his death, um, you know, mm -hmm. metaphorically and obviously not physically. He obviously knows that he's not going to die. Right. Um, but for me, it's kind of, and I've seen some of this online uh, with some people, treating disablement as death. And I really hope that uh, he grows this season into right. realising that he's not going to die from this and he's going to have a good life. The life is going to continue. Just sort of addressing that issue instead of putting down um, some members of our of our society uh, who do have um, these uh, impairments. Uh, I'm trying to say the right words here. You know, that they are... It's, right. it's part of life. These things happen. Uh, it's not the end of your life. Uh, and you can certainly contribute a lot more. How Pike will contribute uh, being on television. That is very We're true. Not sure. Yes. And we should say, though, and I and you're right, I, I saw that rise up and I fall in the trap of thinking his fate with the cadets and being in the wheelchair with the beep and one beep or two is death. And it's obviously not death. And he's still able to function. To the point where, you know, Spock tries to take him back to Talos Four at the end to live with the Talosians. OK. Um, and have even more. But there is a spectrum of impairment and some people are able to do um, to, to, to function in life, to do to fulfill their dreams and their what they want to do with their life and their abilities. And they're able to do that at different degrees, depending on the degree of their impairment from, uh, you know, whatever ground zero is for that's considered normal. And the rise of technology is making more and more people able to deal with whatever impairments they have, whether it's vision or whether it's mobility and limbs or whatever, you know, like the long and by the time another two or 300 years go by, there'll be even more tech assists. We'll have, you know, bionics and we'll have AI, you know, the whole, we'll be, we'll be going into board dark territory or whatever. But um, the idea with Pike was that it was, to me, it was always that it was so severe. The wheelchair, the, the motorized chair was his own. He was mobile to himself. He still needed Spock to help him around a little bit, but maybe that they fixed that with, with, with current TV technology. But the fact that he was still, even with their level of technology, not able to reconnect his brain to where he had to rely on the simple, you know, it was almost tragicomic one beep or two. Um, that's like on the impairment spectrum. That's way down there. So, mm. you know, I get it. And I, I, but a lot of people speaking about ableism uh, have a have a very valid point about there is a whole spectrum before you get to that. And we've, you know, done a lot. And it's unfortunate that even in the 2300s, that more can't be done for Pike at that moment, I'll just say. But yeah. what I'm hoping is that I hope that this is a pilot moment when he actually is slightly debilitated for a moment. He's looking at his arm, his, his, his command chair arm, and they have to snap him out of it. I mean, that's not going to be the image of the commanding, forceful, you know, and even humorous Pike. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking maybe that was one of those things that they emphasize in the pilot. And then as you watch episodes on Spool, they don't revisit that every single episode, right? Yep. Hundred percent, and because and, it would make and, him a weak, he would make him weaker. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. And I think that's a little bit of, um, you know, we've talked about this in the past about uh, commentary, weekly commentary uh, on a series that's laid out uh, in the writers' room for a whole season. We don't know that mm -hmm. whole tapestry, um, and as you say, obviously a pilot moment, uh, and things that are to come. We we are told that there are going to be uh, some season long threads, um, but we do mm -hmm. have our standalone show of the week. Um, um, that show of the week, uh, the way Pike addressed uh, this nation, an interesting callback to Discovery as well in, in the way that they solved mm -hmm. uh, the burn. Um, I think it was the burn. Was it the burn? No, that burn was season three. Whatever the season two galactic anomaly was. Um, <laughs> We had something going the red on. Suit, the five lives, yeah, that's the right. Bit, that's yeah. what it was. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that was before they left. Um, an interesting callback. <laughs> I like that. That they were just watching um, that uh, resolution unfold, and that's how they got their uh, warp technology. Um, certainly, an interesting plot point. I don't think we've ever seen that in 750 Star Trek episodes. There, yeah. I mean, that's. I think it drove some fans mad that they were watching Strange New Worlds to have a standalone episodic structure and a break from Discovery and then have all this callbacks to, to Discovery. It was like, come on, guys. <laughs> it's like the prime sliver of Star Trek 09 at the beginning, and people don't want to, like, remember that there was a prime sliver before, you know, before it, before it went off into the Kelvin universe was created. So, but it's, yeah. it's, the more we, the more we, and I know what you're saying about the week to, I mean, I enjoyed the week to week until it got just really silly. 
I, 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 I still like the week to week delivery system because it feels old school to me. I know they enjoy the, the network, the streamer enjoys it because the buzz is bigger than if you drop 10 or 12 at once and the buzz lasts for two or three weeks and gets cold. I, I think it, it prolongs the discussion as if Star Trek fans need any, any prodding to talk about it all year long. But, um, but you know, I, yeah, I, I, it, it's, I just see so many more positives than negatives. Now I do see a lot of canon handholding. Like I ran through two or three of them there, Sam Kirk versus Samuel and to bring the Gorn is another one. People are upset that La'an's pad mentions her family trauma about being attacked and taken hostage yeah. by Gorn or whatever. But if you notice, it, it's a, it's one thing. It's brilliant. Tim Peel and the graphics, the motion graphics, whether it's three D or two D, the planet displays and the star charts. And I'll brag, they're using the star charts that you know, that from Michael Kuda to Jeff Mandel to me have been built up with confidence. They're using them, and it's awesome to see. And on Picard too, by the way. But um, those graphics that are so crystal clear, you can look at Lon's pad. I refuse to say Nunian Singh because it's fifteen syllables. Um, Talking about the Gorn, there's a sentence that says, however, this has been neither confirmed or, um, or you know, uh, talks about it being hazy. So maybe it was Gorn, maybe it wasn't. But in the same way that there were Borg rumors that led the Hansons out to go explore that, before yeah. formal first contact. And heaven forbid Archer running into Borgs and Ferengis and not even knowing what they were. So I, I, I think they've, they've, there's so many things they have covered here. It's, I mean, yeah, there's, there's going to be a, you know, there's going to be a wince moment every now and then, but maybe it'll get explained. But I, I feel like I've been doing a lot of handholding online this last week, <laughs> reassuring a lot of folks. Well, look, this has been covered, or they, they, they looked at this, or we don't know the full story, or, you know, don't just because we got one bit of information 30 years ago from nine years in the future doesn't mean we don't know what's going on right now in 2259. So, you know, it's been fun that way exactly and right. i think i think we're fine i think we're fine right let's 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 enjoy the for once i can say like you said enjoy the adventure and just go with it and on top of all this matt we haven't even seen hemmer the very blandly named uh enar enar and dorian chief engineer yet so we've got more to see there is so much happening uh picard has wrapped strange new worlds is here we've got plenty to talk about over the coming weeks not only and we've also got prodigy uh the second uh half of the season uh to to come as well another season of lower decks there's so much star trek i love it i'm sure you're excited as mm -hmm. well larry thanks for beaming in thanks for having a trek sun conversation thanks trek well matt